Welcome to Uppsala University and UpTalk Weekly. UpTalk Weekly is a popular science seminar series organized by the Faculty for Science and Technology. This seminar series is created to give alumni and everyone interested a possibility to meet and interact with our researchers and to learn more about the scientific work they are conducting in the field of technology and or natural sciences. So you are welcome to ask your questions at any point during the seminar in the chat to my colleague Karin Tellenberg, and we will bring it into the discussion with our guest. My name is Lina Soos Emerson. I work at UPTEC with assignment to build bridges between the technology activities at our university and the surrounding society. And today I'm your host when we meet Robin Augustine, Associate Professor in Medical Engineering. Robin's research is in the midst of what is possible with technology when it, com when it comes to connecting our brain to machines, making humans into cyborgs. Where cyborgs are persons with both organic and biomechatronic integrated body parts. In practice, this technology can make a huge difference for paralyzed people by making it possible for them to control assistive devices using their thoughts, or for people that have lost a limb to control a prosthetic device. During several years, Robin has built a diverse research team and a diverse professional network that today have provided him and colleagues with a prestigious grant from the European Union to build a wireless body area network that can communicate without involving an external computer while transmitting signals from the brain to a prosthetic arm through body fat. This way of transmitting microwave signals in the body is a radical technology that not only integrates the artificial arm with human thought and perception, but it also increases the security since it's much harder to hack a technology in a body when all the communication takes place under the skin. In fact, it makes it really hard for anyone to eavesdrop on your thoughts or take control of your integrated prosthetic device. It's a pleasure for me to invite Robin to join us so we can learn more about brain machine interface and the age of cyborgs. Welcome to UpTalk Weekly, Robin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lena, for this awesome introduction. Um, I'm Robin Augustin, um, Associate Professor at the Solid State Electronics Division of Electrical Engineering Department here at Dongstrom of Solar University. I'm also heading the group of Micros in Medical Engineering. So as Lena has already mentioned, you focus on different, different fields of medical applications of electronics and electronic systems, um, ranging from musculoskeletal health to monitoring uh, brain activities. Uh, and B Kratos, the project Lena mentioned, was the very recent addition to our portfolio of research that addresses brain machine interface. So, if we go back a little bit, maybe you can tell us um, where you're from, Robin, and what is your background, and then we go into your research. Sure, um, that's <laughs> I have a I have an interesting background, I presume. Uh, my, I'm from India, from a small state of Kerala, southwest of India originally. Um, I had uh, my bachelor's in electronics, master's in robotics, ESD, in um, variable antennas, on-body antennas, a postdoctoral research, postdoctoral formation on bioelectromagnetism, and of course, advanced research in uh, sensors. So I have um, a wide spectrum of, of experience. I have also worked with uh, ultrasounds for underwater communication. So I think you know it's basically my uh, formation has enabled me to uh, establish research in biomedicine, and also my contact with clinicians has helped me a lot. So uh, basically, what you work with is uh, sensors and signals to how machines can communicate with bodies for a medical uh, aspect. Is that correct? Yeah, um, I, I work with sensors that could um, register biometric data, uh, both from musculoskeletal uh, 
you know, conditions as well as um, neuronal data for intracranial pressure monitoring. But I don't uh, do specific research on electrodes, for instance, to, to collect neuronal data. But I facilitate the transport of the data from the brain to a different peripheral part of the body. Okay. What is biometric data for, for our listeners who is not used to deal with a lot of data? So what is the difference between biometric data and neuronal data? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's basically the same. So biometric data uh, is any data that is pertaining a bi biophysical activity, a biological activity, for instance. If, if you are measuring the muscle activity, okay, so uh, the muscle signals, which is all either otherwise called electromyogram, which is the, the voltage, the potential that is developed in muscle fibers. If you can sense that, that is a kind of biometric data. So if you're measuring ECG, the electrocardiogram, in that case, you're measuring the heart uh, electrical uh, function. So this is what we see on all, you know, these monitors next to you. It's like, you know, these waves of the heart, how it works, that is biometrical data. That's correct. Okay. Uh, how come you started to work in this field? I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do with your background as an engineer. How come you decided to work in, in medical technology? Yeah, my aspiration was, you know, when I was a child was to become a doctor, a medical doctor. Uh, and uh, you know, there, there's, there's a small history, I mean, there is a small story that I want to share. Okay, I have enrolled in the university uh, to pursue a medical career. I wanted to become a biologist. And later on, when I went at, into the university for the first day of my, my college, then I saw that my, my listing of the name is not in the medical line, not in the biology classes, but in the engineering class. So I saw that my mother has changed it <laughs> because she, she thought that, okay, if I don't become a doctor, then maybe I will not succeed in my career. Um, then uh, I thought, okay, that's that's fine because I all equally like engineering and mathematics, and uh, probably my call is there to to become a medical engineer. Uh, so I had a liking from my childhood towards medicine, and then uh, during the course of my formation, I was also good at networking with clinicians because I thought of I was sort of good at understanding the medical problems and uh, the challenges that has to be addressed using engineering applications or engineering techniques. So that's where I, I started and, and uh, was interested in, in working in this domain. So if we go back, when I made a small intro to, you, to your up talk here today, I talked about cyborgs, that it's a person with both organic and biomechatronic integrated body parts. Can you explain what a biomechatronics is? So right. we can like move on and understand really what, what, what is a cyborg? <laughs> yeah. If, if, you, if you think about it, we are living image cyborgs uh, in, the, in the present day scenario. So a person with a cochlear implant is a cyborg. A person with a pacemaker is a cyborg. So by definition, um, any sort of implant or an instrument or a, a device that would restore a lost functionality of the body can be deemed in the category of cyborg. I mean, uh, a person who is carrying that is, is a cyborg. And it doesn't have to be a human at all. It can be an organism, it can be a mammal, or it can be a, a living bee with that. So um, when, it, when it comes to biomechatronics, um, so me mechatronics is something that has electronics and some mechanics function in incorporated into it. A prosthetic hand is a one good example of a biomechatronic de device. So that could, that could enable you to do a physical activity with it, but the controlling mechanism is through electronics. Okay, so another thing I talked about, because what you are doing, you're not working on the heart today and, and these kind of devices, you are, are targeting our brain, <laughs> where we have our thoughts, where we have our personality, and you do that through something called brain machine interfaces, but there's a lot of words for it, and I you know, could you, could you explain what a brain machine interface is? Yeah, I mean, in very, uh, very simple words, a brain machine interface is a device that connects uh, the brain activity, and in the end of the day, it's the neural activity to an external world. Uh, it can be a computer, it can be uh, a, a device or a machine that could that, that can do a certain function. 
So, so here you have to have a, a direct contact. Uh, you have to you have to have a, in, a device that is sitting there then and there, uh, in the proximity of those neurons, that are basically responsible for the signaling, which 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 is evoked by our thoughts, um, and, and pick them out and, and bring this outside the brain to the the uh, realm of, of of what you can see and it would be able to process it so that you can make uh, you know uh, fruitful and meaningful operations with it so, so yeah so uh, in a person normally when we think and we move yeah we think something this is transmitted into electrical signals that is passed through cells it goes from the brain down to our spinal cord and down out to muscles so basically what you are doing is that you are taking up these electrical signals from the nerve cells and then sending them and bypassing the, the spinal cord. Could I say that? So if you like you have had an injury on the spinal cord, you could still send the brain signals to a muscle in an uh, arm. Is that correct? Yes, Lena, this is, this is something that I w wanted to, um, to introduce as a surprise. <laughs> because, okay <laughs> because because this is how things are done uh, i mean th this is how thing things are executed inside the body so then you you call it a biological nervous system right so so the biological information highway is your spinal cord so that is connected from your brain stem to the very end of the the, the spinal cord so at, at different levels it, it channels the information from the brain to different organs yeah right so what, as, as you as you Julie mentioned, Lena. So if something happens to your spinal cord, how would you transfer this information from the brain to that specific organ in order to have this uh, organ functioning, uh, uh, keeping you alive? Even 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 that that condition could happen. So so if the spinal cord injury arrives to a person, so then you should have a method to bypass that, and still get the information from the brain and deliver it to the concerned organ. And for example, you know, take, take the case of your, your legs. Okay, you have you know, multiple groups of muscles involved in gaze in order to help you stand up and walk, right? And do, do your daily, daily job. Uh, but if, if the neuronal highway is broken, then of course you could do that by bridging your brain, somehow bringing the information to those muscles and stimulate by stimulating those muscles. So here, what we are devising is to create an electromagnetic highway, a pathway from the brain to those organs uh, under the skin through your fat layer, right? So, so the fat layer inside uh, your body, under the skin and above the muscle, basically act as a waveguide in order to contain the signal and bridge the information from the brain to where it is needed. So does this mean that you implant computer chips into the brain and then you have computer chips at another part of the body that can receive this signal is this how this technology works exactly i mean as as you mentioned you need interfaces and interfaces are those transducers that changes the energy or uh, or the signals from one form to the other so you have basically neural signals they are firing of action potentials they are firing of neurons or let's say simply voltages so you want to pick those voltages convert that on and uh, convert that into uh, currents. And those currents would be eventually translated or transferred in, uh, in the form of electromagnetic waves. Okay, And these waves would propagate along your body and get to a device, a chip, that can translate those electromagnetic signals back to electric stimuli, which could stimulate such an organ in order to function. So you need those interfaces, which are those chips. So you need implants. You're right. So. Um... This is the technology that, are, are you alone? Uh, have you developed this technology to, to send microwave signals through fat? Is that correct? Is your invention? It's, it's yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's our invention. It's, it's, uh, it's my group who has pioneered on fat and robotic communication. So, so as you mentioned, it's a, a groundbreaking technology which was not heard of before. There, there have been a lot of intrabody communication techniques uh, and it has been historically thought that you cannot use electromagnetics, especially microwaves, for in-body communication 
given that the body is a hostile environment, it absorbs energy. And this is the reason why the microwave oven works, right? It absorbs energy, translates energy into heat. Whereas if you could channel the energy in fat, you know, you don't translate the energy into heat, but it is basically a, an, a dielectric in, in our terms. So how come you, how, how did you come up with this idea and, and why, why do you think it's nobody else did before you? <laughs> Yeah, but th this is because of the aversion that people had towards microwave and all those concerns regarding exposure from the micro mobile phones and so such. So people were, you know, as I said, for historical reasons, thinking that microwave and, and humans are like, you know, no, not on the same page, but we are using mobile phone on our daily basis. And it has, and you know, it, mobile phone or smartphones are also another definition of cyborg. We are, we are so much you know, intricately connected to mobile phone. So it's, it's an electronic device and that has become part of our body and we cannot think about a single day without it. So, so we are very much in, in symbiosis with such a device. But anyhow, so it uses microwaves. So I, you know, I was also studying because, you know, as part of my, uh, my career in bioelectromagnetism, I had the opportunity to study different tissues in the spectrum of microwave. Then I also found that fat is a tissue that more or less acts as a dielectric, which is, of low loss and through low loss materials, microwave transfers easily. And whereas you have the skin and muscle who have higher conductivity and higher dielectric, so they, they act as natural barriers in order to confine those signals within. So you have like, you know, uh, a na naturally built uh, a waveguide system where you can you know, confine the signal and transport the signal from one end to the other. You can propagate it within the body. So, so that thought, you know, struck me hard, and I thought, okay, we should have some, some, some experimentation in the lab in order to have the first proof of concept, and then, you know, scale that up to different levels, you know, to try ex vivo, in vivo, and even clinical trials to see the the feasibility of the idea, and and it proved to be working, and we have also created theoretical models around it. Is this part of this project that I mentioned in the intro, uh, which is actually named after a Greek god that is the divine personification of strength, Kratos, I love that sentence, divine personification of strength. So the project is Kratos and this goddess name is Kratos. So is this the project that... Uh... Exactly, exactly. So B. Kratos evolved out of our ambition uh, and our search for a high data rate application. So we have another project called Syntec, I mean, which uh, Professor Klaus Hood is, is uh, coordinating. And we are a significant part of that project where we try to fuse data from multitude of sensors, one on the body, uh, and enabling those sensors to work at the same time. Right? But again, you know, when it comes to like, you know, uh, basic biophysical uh, registration, you don't need very large bandwidth. So we were really after some applications where you need large bandwidth. And then I met with John Donahue, Professor John Donahue from Brown University, and who is a pioneer in the area of brain computer interface. And as to, to quote his words, he mentioned that you know, one of the bottlenecks of brain computer interface, brain machine interface in, in the general sense, is the amount of data the wireless channel, uh, you know, what is present nowadays could, could afford, could, 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 uh, could have the capacity of, of the bandwidth is a, a serious bottleneck. So, but here, here we are, so we can use microwaves and we can uh, address the bandwidth limitation. We can have, provide the bandwidth, whatever you need. In, in B Kratos project, we can have 50 MB megabytes. What is, what, what is bandwidth, large bandwidth? What do you mean when you say large bandwidth? For yeah, I mean, yeah, you can put it like this. You, bandwidth is, is, the, is simply the amount of data that you can pass at the same time, right? So in the context of the neuronal reading, maybe you have to pick the signals from the neurons through thousands of electrodes, right? Because the brain is a large structure. And then you, get, you want to get as much as, uh, as, much as data as possible. Uh, so for that, you need to have a lot of electrodes and a lot of electrodes constitutes to you know, a lot of data. And then in order to handle those data to be transmitted at the same time, you need large bandwidth. So bandwidth is basically the capacity of the channel. So, so we could provide that capacity. So in B Kratos, yeah, we are addressing that that specific bottleneck. 
Okay, so uh, like a project like B Kratos and, and being able to take all of this data, what kind of expertise do you need? Because I know you mentioned you've been networking a lot with the medical and you've been building your team also, so it's diverse and that you're... So can you tell us about what, what kind of people needs to be on board in a project like this to actually make it valuable for people or make it uh, ap applicable in some sense? Yeah, we, we need people, uh, okay, as you said, I mean, you, you had this question that, okay, you can't, I mean, can you do this alone? No, no way, you can't do it alone. So you need a, a very strong team of scientists and experts from different fields. So this is a, a pure merger, a pure marriage of expertise from you know, quite different areas, uh, from neuroscience, uh, from biomechatronics, biomedical engineering, from mathematics, from AI, from machine learning. So, so you have a lot of different fields here, you know, to ha have their specific roles in order to have the final system to be working. Um, so for, for instance, we have um, the biomechatronic experts from Italy, from Pisa. We have machine learning experts, machine learning experts from um, Lynx Foundation, which is also from Italy. We do have back, batteryless backscatter experts from NTNU, we have us. <laughs> and then we also have neuroscientists from uh, from Germany. We also have those uh, those companies who could make those very fine electrodes called Black Rock Microsystem from Germany. So we have like five to six countries and seven to eight partners involved in this project. So it's, it's a big consortium and a range of expertise involved. Another thing that I mentioned regarding this technology that you are developing microwaves in fat and that we can send signals in under the skin, basically. I said that it's, it increases security. That's right. And that could you tell us why and how it increases securities in comparison to other technologies that transmit brain signals to devices? That's right. You know, uh, maybe, maybe I should go outright in comparison with Neuralink. So Neuralink is very hot, right? Um, Tell us what Neuralink is yeah, well, <laughs> for the ones who's not here. <laughs> so yeah, Neural Neuralink. I mean, I, I I have a lot of appreciation and admiration for Elon Musk for what he what he is doing. So he's having a diversified investment, and he's 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 a scientist, and I I, I really connect to him. So what Neuralink does, Neuralink is his company uh, with an ambition to connect the brain to computer, brain to to internet, brain to another brain. So they are basically working in the realm of brain computer interface. So what it, they do is basically uh, relay the information, relay the brain activity outside the brain to a computer, yeah, and, and use that information to, to have advanced processing. Um, so, so they've been successful in relaying information from a pig's brain in vivo and very recently from a monkey. Right. So in, in, in contrast, what we try to do is, 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 is the following. So we are not relaying the information from the brain to an external uh, entity. So the, the brain information is used by the person for his own uh, regaining of the function. For example, you know, the brain is, is connected to a bionic arm. So it is used to connect uh, and control the arm, but also to get the feedback from the arm back to the brain so that it can you know, it can be a symbiosis between the brain and the arm, and the arm eventually becomes cognitively integrated into the perception of the person, and he finds that, okay, this is his lost limb, and he has regained it. And coming back to the question about how it improves security, and this is by two methods, okay? First of all, we are trying to confine the, the whole signaling process within the body as if our neuronal system is working, right? So you cannot tap into your, I mean, a person, a second person cannot, understand how my neurons are signaling and what they are signaling about, right? So it, it, it works in the same way because it is confined below the skin. So you, 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 you reduce any sort of leakage. And then of course, because you're using the fat in order to communicate, you can use very, very low power, right? Very, low, very much lower than Bluetooth communication protocols, uh, which even reduces further leakage from the body. So, so you cannot eavesdrop into it's very difficult to eavesdrop into those, those kind of communications. And this brings us to another thing. When we think about brain-computer interference, brain-machine inter interaction, uh, and we think about the brain, it's our person, it's our personality, all things we are is happening within the brain and then 
you know, propagate it out to the body to interact with the environment around us. It's really scary if we hack this technology, if we like can be and go in and, you know, put chips into the brain and people can get access to us. I must, pro, you know, private things. And this brings us to ethics and also to law. So I know that you in your project are addressing these things. Could you talk to us a little bit about the ethics around doing this kind of, of technologies and developments? So. Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very relevant. And, and I'm very glad that you have asked this question because that's, that's also something that, you know, every researcher involved in the area is, um, is considering. Right. I mean, we have to have because even even though it's a longer perspective in time, uh, you know, when we are really, you know, in image the, the situation, it, it will take some time to get there. But still, it's important to be prepared. OK, I mean, just coming before coming to that ethics po point of view, I would like to still address the security uh, issue and okay. see and say that, OK, how we are addressing that also, because, you know, we, we have I mean, when we are developing a technology, we should be also responsible. We have to develop the, the technology in a responsible way to, be, to begin with. So we also have another project, uh, thanks to this uh, strategic Swedish foundation uh, project called LifeSec, which is coordinated by my good colleague and friend, uh, Professor Thema Focht. It is called Don't Hack My Body. So, so the whole point is not to hack one's body. Uh, you know, you, you can have such a fantastic uh, intra-body communication system, but you want this communication system to be foolproof that no one could, yeah, it, it should be very your difficult. Stop pacemaker, yeah. basically. Yeah. <laughs> or, or put a ransomware and ask for money, so, <laughs> right? So, so what we try to do is, is to, um, to, uh, to make it secure on different levels, on the physical layer level and the communication level. And, you know, so there are like different layers uh, in, in a communication protocol. So we try to secure all the layers of the protocol. Um, so with the, with the physical layer, I, I just mentioned how we, we are trying to do it, you know, physically, uh, you know, con confine, encapsulate the, the signaling process and also to use low power. And that's one aspect. Another aspect is also to introduce encryptions and encoding uh, of this signaling of, of these messages so that, you know, people cannot, cannot tap into, even if they can't, can somehow tap into, they can't read, it will be of no use to them. So that's okay. That's one point. The other thing is that regarding ethics, um, you know, uh, in the present day scenario, um, what you are trying to grab from the brain activity is a snippet of the activity of the landscape, the, the, the spatial and temporal landscape of, of the brain. It's only a snippet, it's only a window, right? So this is what you are able to, to, to get uh, out. So that information is nothing related to what you want to do tomorrow or uh, what you're thinking in your deeper deeper mind, so to speak. So it is it is very much related to your biological action. Like for example, the, how you, you are going to control your hand or, or, or your leg or whatever. So it's, 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 it's only that level of information that you are at the present day scenario able to tap out, okay? We have a question here and time is sure. running. We all know sure. have two minutes left. So I will yeah, interrupt sorry. here so we can take yeah, the yeah. question from, from Morgan. It was said that microwaves are being used for transmission. Microwaves are regarded as one type of EMF. You have to explain EMF, which is known as a harmful for bodily tissues, especially in the brain. Knowing that, does it mean that you are taking the bad with the good in your mission? So what is EMF? So we know that. And then are you taking the bad with the good in your mission? And Right. Uh, so... Okay, coming back to EMF, EMF is electromagnetic field. Um, as okay. as I understand. So yes, as, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning of my talk, yes, microwave has been historically regarded to be, no, I, I would not say uh, malign, but uh, you know, some people deem it to be not biocompatible because it can't, I mean, so if you, if you talk, I mean, it can be a big discussion about it, a separate discussion about it, but you know, the, no, the only uh, proven effect of microwaves is, is the generation of heat, right? So it can, if, if, you if you have going above certain limits as well as certain threshold, it can generate, it can accumulate heat in, in living tissue because, you know, it can agitate water molecules, it goes, goes into vibration and yeah, creates heat. Um, but, you know, here uh, we are not using high power, we are using very, very like nanowatt level power, which is, I mean, you, you are exposed to it on a daily basis in a Wi-Fi environment, for instance, you know, you're exposed to more than that. 
Um, so, so I mean, if you think about it seriously, that there is no health risk or health concerns around this. And this is also why, uh, you know, uh, the formal ethical approvals are not never being difficult to, to obtain. So we have come to a half an hour, Robin. It's just yeah. fly away. So uh, very quickly, you get a few seconds basically sure. to tell us uh, what can we expect of this uh, technology that you are uh, working with? Where will we see it in the future in our daily lives? Yeah, Lena, I should also add one thing, which is also prestigious and, and uh, it's, it's very a, a matter of being proud for Uppsala University that we have another groundbreaking technology called artificial skin or bionic skin involved from also from my own home division uh, uh, by a group headed by Professor Zibin Tsang and uh, yeah, it, the group is called Flexible Electronics. So they are making you know high resolution tactile sensing sensation. I will interrupt you, but sorry, because time is flying. Right, and right. So, so, yeah. So, so we, we are going to expect uh, a system that has a bidirectional communication, uh, which is connected to the brain and a, and a hand. And the person or the organism which is using it would be able to use and feel that bionic prosthetics or ex extremity, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Next week, Uptalk Weekly will be in Swedish. And it's the last Tuesday of the month, so we will have a panel discussion where our invited guest will talk about research dreams, how we create interest and curiosity in children for science. Thursday next week, we will have an extra bonus uh, panel discussion, and uh, it's entitled Long-Term Symptoms of COVID-19. What have we learned so far? And this seminar will also be in Swedish. Robin, thank you for joining us today, telling us about how we can work with integration of brain and machines in a safe way and do tremendously good and also have to look out for some really big challenges on the go. And we also like to thank all our, everyone in our audience for joining us today. And welcome back next week.